Hello, Facebook land and others who have logged on to the Jazz Journalists Association's uh, Zoom event today called um, Reviewing Live in the Age of COVID. And our question is whether uh, reviewing live performances uh, during this time when we do not have in-person performances really are, um, if those reviews are really happening. So we've, uh, I'm still letting some people in, which is why you're hearing little noises. Um, but let me introduce our panelists today. We have Paul DeBarros from Seattle, a uh, writer and uh, biographer, uh, formerly a features writer and editor at the Seattle Times. Uh, Melissa Davis, who is the news editor for the Seattle Times, and she used to work with uh, Paul on uh, features. Uh, Jordana Elizabeth is a freelance writer and uh, media person based in Baltimore. Andy Gilbert is a freelancer um, based in the Bay Area. Andy and Paul DeBarros are both uh, board members of the Jazz Journalists Association. Here's Henry Wong, who is the uh, owner operator of Andi Music in Baltimore. And Ann Braithwaite, a uh, publicist well known to all of us who are uh, working the Jazz Journalists Association for stellar work in um, uh, representing a number of uh, musicians and clients. And uh, Lafayette Gilchrist, wonderful pianist, composer, and band leader, also based in Baltimore. And um, on call also, we have Susan Brink, who's a board member of the Jazz Journalists Association. We have Pamela Espel Espelon, a member from uh, Minneapolis St. Paul and Jim Wilkie, a Seattle member. And so far, I don't see anybody else, but we're welcome all. And uh, thank you for coming. And thanks for being interested in pursuing this topic today. Oh, I'm Howard Mandel. I'm president of the Jazz Journalists Association. Um, so let's start. Uh, who has been doing performances live streaming? That would be Lafayette Gilchrist and Henry Wong. So, um, Henry, maybe you could start just talking a little bit about when you began doing live streaming from Andai Music. Uh, uh, thank you for your invitation, Howard. Uh, Andai Music, we have been a hub for classical and jazz um, uh, musicians for more than uh, 18 years. We started as a CD store in 1990 and, and start doing a concert in 2002. And just last March, uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we actually uh, right away we kind of pivoted our to convert our regular performance into a live streaming event, uh, event uh, place, and uh, we become a broadcast studio since March twentieth, two thousand twenty, and we have done two hundred shows so far. Two hundred shows! Ooh, wow, that's amazing. Wow. So, okay, let me ask Lafayette. Um, you have performed at Andai Music. Um, how is that? Do you enjoy it? Very much so. So much so that uh, I just uh, I just completed a performance there uh, a week ago. Solo, a solo or with a band? Concert. A solo piano concert um, a week ago. Um, They've been, they've, been, they've been really wonderful experiences. Um, they've been, I recall my first time doing it, um, it the only strange thing was, um, it would obviously be strange with, with, with no audience uh, in your immediate uh, uh, contact. And so that, that made, um, that made the, the um, first time performed um it made it a little different because i hadn't um i hadn't anticipated the uh the difference of the of the feel from the perspective of the energy hmm. uh, that's, that's in the room uh, I, I um the only thing about performing in the live stream situation with without an audience there in person is you really do have to, to bring it to do two things, you have to bring it up from within, and then it's a leap of faith that ears out there that you make in a um, connection. 
Um, so that's what it's um, like, um, you know, in, ter in terms of just the performance. Um, um, from a point of view of just um, a, a place to come and perform, uh, yeah, Andy's been, Andy's been like a refuge. Uh, like a, uh, it, it, it's, it's really been uh, um, a, 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 a good thing uh, overall, um, experiential wise. And you've performed at some other venues also that have been live streaming, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, Keystone Corner. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, an outdoor um, uh, uh, series in, in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we performed uh, in, in various people's uh, backyards. Uh, Moda's name escapes me, man. Please forgive me, man. Uh, That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Maybe it'll come to you. Um, Sorry so, to interrupt, but didn't you do a Vanguard one too, Lafayette? Oh yes, we did. Uh, David Murray and I, we did. Uh, we did uh, two duets. We did a weekend of uh, duets at the Vanguard. Thanks for reminding me. Um, yeah, we did. Uh, we did two dates at the Vanguard. Uh, um, Oh man, what was that about maybe six months ago? Was the energy different having a duet partner? Oh yeah, I mean, just because I had played the Vanguard with David, um, you know, before the COVID and I mean, uh, the energy was, was, was great. We played there for a week and there was, there were lines every night, you know, and it's the, you know, it's the best, uh, most prestigious uh, jazz club in New York. Uh, so it was quite a different experience walking down those stairs and seeing the setup like it was. Uh, it, was uh, it was a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a little scary because, you know, uh, my first impression of coming to New York and, and Going into the Village Vanguard was like, wow, man, this place is way smaller than, <laughs> I, than I thought. Then my impression coming back and looking at it during the pandemic is like, wow, I never knew the place had so much space in it. <laughs> <laughs> Lafayette, I'm empty. curious if I might ask you, because we were all curious about how the Vanguard's doing. Did they tell you how many streams you get when you do a performance there? Um, no, I don't remember. I, I don't remember. Um, I, I, I don't recall them giving me that information. I don't want to say no. Because I was curious, because some people are of the opinion that wow, so what, nobody can come in the door. People can tune in from anywhere in the world. So maybe the numbers will be even bigger in terms of listeners than the 175 people that can get into that club. So, but we haven't been able to really find out anything from them. I'd like to, I'm curious for both Lafayette and for Henry, have any of your performances you've either done Lafayette or produced Henry been covered, been reviewed? And what kind of press have um, your events gotten, if any? Should I, should I, should I, okay. Please. Um, we have been covered by uh, Baltimore Sun and some Baltimore local online uh, services. They have uh, featured our many concerts on each week. Um, and definitely we also been on the local national networks on CBS and NBC and ABC, and also uh, Maryland Public Television too. So. Have they previewed them or have they reviewed them? No, they just preview. And then right. for, the pub, for the national television, they actually have a camera person came in and and take uh, video clips of the live stream. Uh, so, and then they will broadcast them on the evening news, uh, okay. the same evening and also the next day. You're 
also Lafayette's concert is supposed to be reviewed in the wire. So his most recent one is going to have a review on the wire. I don't think it's been posted mm. yet, but that was nice to get. So it's, it is interesting. It's an opportunity to go beyond the local community, but it's also, I, not a lot of people are reviewing. Uh, well, but most of the reviewers are from, I'm sorry to interrupt, are from the, the patrons that are watching the show. Yeah. So because we, we, we are airing it on, air, on YouTube, so there are plenty of comments throughout the whole concert. And I would say 100%, if not more than 100%, they love the sound, they love, the, they love to see Lafayette performing either by himself solely or with duo or trio. Uh, they love the concert they did. He did with uh, David Murray uh, a couple of times. And so they really, a lot of people, they are very enthusiastically uh, sending their inputs and their feelings throughout the, the live streaming among the, uh, the patrons. Henry, do you have a sense of where people are watching from? Oh, yes. Um, we have people watching all over the world. Uh, we have people bought tickets from Germany. Uh, I actually wrote to some of those people and asked them how they, they actually found us. Uh, we were actually featured in, on April and there is a magazine in Europe called Jazz in Europe. Mm -hmm. They actually mentioned one of our, our live streaming concert. It was a Warren Wolf with Joshua Espanosa, which is vibraphone and piano. So uh, that magazine picked it up and promoted for us in last, I think it's last April. I have to say that, and I think Andy has probably had a similar experience during the pandemic, which has now been what a year. I've done one review of a live stream, and one preview of a live stream in for the Seattle Times. That's it. Downbeat, who I also write for, is not interested. So, it's a pretty slim market for reviewing. I know Melissa, you have some thoughts about that as an as an editor. You weren't my editor, but um, for, for this period, but you know what's going on. I mean, are, are we just never going to have reviews of live streams, or will it become regular? It depends, I think, on on your newsroom and your newsroom priorities, as well as your, of course, your newsroom budget. Um, a lot of our coverage, and it's easy for me to say this because I'm not in that department anymore. I'm off in news hard newsland now, but. Um, we've done a lot of experiential coverage like here's what it's like to watch a concert online here's what it's like to mm -hmm. watch an opera online or here you know these here's 85 hallmark movies i watched in a row and why that's bad for you it's more of <laughs> here is how you can try and get something it is bad for you i mean it has to, um how a lot more focus on here's how you can still live during the pandemic and, and try not to um, crawl up the walls kind of a thing. Um, and a lot of that too does does come down to budgeting, Paul. Your preview of Earshot, you know, was paid for by a grant. Not to demean it in any way, but, but um, you know, that's grants for classical music and now for jazz are are really a big going thing which is which is great but you also as a former arts editor i kind of hate to see it that that's how we have to get these things paid for i you know i wish we did more uh online reviews just so people could know that hey there's new stuff going out going on out there here's a way to see somebody that you normally would not get to see because you couldn't go to that city or pay that ticket price or maybe you want to be able to just watch a concert on your own time you'd rather watch it during the day i don't want to have to go out somewhere at night or maybe people have mobility issues and it's easier for them to watch at home so i think there's still a lot of service to be done reviewing online as well as just being part of that reviewing community that I think is really vital. Yeah, Jordana, I'm really curious what your experience has been pitching or writing or, you know, editors approaching you regarding um, live stream reviews. What, what's that been like? Yeah, early on, um, I did a couple of pieces, particularly jazz on lockdown, um, you know, with the Jazz Journalists Association where, you know, there were some people who were 
able to see the trend that was going to happen. So I wrote a piece on irreversible entanglements um, and I was uh, the host of a live, um, a live stream uh, presentation of a number of um, performances from women jazz musicians through a mutual mentorship for musicians, which is Sarah Serpa and Jen Shu's new organization. Mm -hmm. They brought me on as the editor in chief. Um, so we'll, we will be writing um, some anthologies, uh, an anthology um, with the, along with the presentations. But, you know, I have really been taking this time to get my writing chops up in general. Um, probably more album reviews um, and cover stories per, per, uh, specifically for um, New York City Jazz Record. Um, so yes, I, I've participated and I also did another piece uh, on Black women uh, jazz musicians during COVID-19 very early on in March. Um, and they you know, talked about how some of their students uh, inspired them to get more digitally uh, uh, um, privy, and you know, of course, Brandy Younger has been killing it, you know, with um, live streaming um, and and a number of other musicians. But yeah, as a journalist, um, I have not had the time. I wouldn't say I would. I haven't had the time. I've not had an assignment. Um, to really cover live performances, but um, I keep my eyes open and Henry reached out to me on a, a, for one of the Andy music um, performances very really recently. And I, you know, I try to do what I can, you know. We all are. Mm -hmm. um, let me uh, introduce, just mentioned because we have a visitor uh, on the uh, discussion, uh, Miriam Abiejo from uh, Madrid. So uh, we wanna say hello to Miriam. She's a JJ member also. And we're really glad that we could schedule this at a time when some mm -hmm. of our European members could uh, participate. So um, I don't know, Miriam, have you been, are there any live um, performances going on in Madrid now? Unmute yourself, unmute yourself. Well, uh, first of all, hi everyone. Uh, good evening from Madrid. Uh, sorry, um, um, I've been here a little late because I've had a problem with with my connection. But uh, I'm sorry I missed the the first um, of your thoughts. Um, so I'm not sure if you are um, exchanging um, really experiences or thoughts of um, if you uh, are curious about the, the, um, the scene in, in Spain or my personal um, uh, writing, uh, could you give me some more details on that. Uh, how are, please? Sure, I, I'm really, we're trying to focus on whether reviews of live performances oh, are okay. occurring. And if there are live performances that are streaming, you know, which I think all the live performances now, most of them are streaming unless they're outside or in somebody's home. So we're curious, are you reviewing anything that is being streamed or are you watching things and saying, I'd like to review that, but there's nobody who wants to publish me or yes, I have a publisher for this. Okay. Well, first of all, probably the person who knows more about my experience during the pandemic is, it's, uh, is indeed is, is Howard. <laughs> uh, and I should uh, share today that yesterday I published my first review on lead music in a year. Just last, you did it on your own blog, on your own platform? Yeah, well, in my blog and a couple of publications with a paywall, uh, but it's in my, in my blog, it's uh, also in my blog. And 
Well, it's actually a little in, uh, essay because I couldn't really write um, a review. Uh, this is something I want to to know about your experience uh, because um, it has been a year uh, from the last live uh, live uh, concert um, and the last one a year of um, very complex things <laughs> and well I felt like I couldn't just write a review um, of course when I'm writing about a concert of uh, an album, I never speak about myself because I am not the subject. Uh, but this time I felt like I needed to share some perspective, uh, historical, personal, uh, and artistic, um, the three of them, because it was the only way to share uh, what really is, what really means to live without love music, okay? So um, I've been reviewing albums basically uh, during 2020, um, some linear notes. Um, I think I, no, I'm, I'm streaming, uh, I can remember reviewing a streaming concert, maybe uh, for the for the just on lockdown, maybe, but not really. And it's not um, a thing in Spain. Uh, I don't think it's a thing in the states either. But I but I've been following uh, concerts uh, streaming in the U.S. Oh. and another and in Germany, uh, but in Spain I think like a couple of them or three of them. Um, we I think that we we really should. Um, I don't want to to. To, uh, to take all the time, uh, but I feel like there is a lot of things to to talk about, you know. Um, I'm very grateful because I have this place and these people. Um, I think like we are um, living a really important um, moment in music history, you know, and in a way we are actors. And I have a, lo a lot of doubts and how are you know that, but, um, but more than ever, I need this community to, to focus on what to do on these challenges uh, do you understand me? I'm sure. Yes. Yes. Well, let, let me ask. I mean, um, Melissa was talking about um, uh, trying to have articles that helped uh, people to acclimate how to live during the pandemic better. Um, and Andy, I guess, I, uh, Andy, do you feel as a freelancer that you have to bring more of yourself into an article right now because of this? Or uh, do we yeah. all shit? Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, I think there's a sense, I've actually written a lot of sort of preview pieces for events that are going to t be live streamed, of course, because that's, that's what there is. And I framed a lot of them in terms of, you know, we're all living through this moment and this is, you know, these artists are living through the moment. There's, there's no way not to talk about that and and bring in you know what it means as a viewer and i think miriam raises i mean there's this fascinating sort of philosophical discussion to have over what it means to write about 
an event, a live stream event. I know, at, you know, covering live concerts, I, I think of myself less as a critic than more as a reporter. I'm going to, to something and I want to cover it. And of course, that involves critical judgment. But I try and, if it's appropriate, take in, you know, set the scene, the ambiance, the history, like, like, like make it, make it a, a story about this event that, that happened at a particular time and, and place. And that, you know, I'm there with the audience. Live streaming, right, is it, it's like the difference between covering a, writing about a, a play as opposed to a movie, right? Uh, once it's live streamed, it's almost always archived. It's, it's endlessly replicable. Anyone can see it at any time. How does that change the, the experience of it? And how much do you, are you take into account production values, um, right? If it's a live stream, you've, as a viewer, we've kind of lost control over how we take it in. You're, you're, you're captive of the angles and uh, that, you know, that the camera, whatever cameras are, are presenting it. You, you know, I go see a Taylor Eichsty concert and I might just focus on Eric Harlan the whole time because that's what I'm feeling and, I'm, and my review would reflect that. Yeah, if the camera doesn't want to show what the, you know, drummer is doing most of the time, it, it's, 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 all, it's all so different. So I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what it would mean, how I w will or, or uh, approach that. I'm curious what other, you know, what other people are, are thinking about that because like I said, I think life, even as we go back to more in-person live performance, you know, whether it's outside or hopefully inside, I think live streaming will play a much, much, much larger role in the jazz ecosystem going forward, certainly than it did pre-pandemic. I think there's, um, you know, a positive uh, point of being able to know that you can go back to a live stream because it's going to be archived and, you know, you can watch it once and, you know, take down those. I can kind of, I would definitely scribble down notes and, um, you know, understand what I was feeling in the moment. Um, but being able to go back and, and review before you send in your piece and, and, you know, kind of having that archival uh, uh, situation can allow other journalists to take their own blogs and begin to archive. And I think this is a historical time um, in music. And I think, you know, personally, um, I have been taking this time to archive pieces about women in jazz. Um, I have a new website called Feminist Jazz Review. Um, which was a column uh, at Jazz Right Now. Thank you to Cisco Bradley, um, who just came out with a book uh, by about William Parker um, from Duke University Press. So congratulations to him. But yeah, I've been I've been taking this time to build a narrative and an archive, kind of on my own websites and and looking at things that we haven't seen historically and. Um, you know, bringing together resources um, for all of the jazz community to be able to refer to um, uh, for for absolute uh, historical and and um, and pos positive purposes. Jordana, I think that whole archival perspective is great. I mm -hmm. and it's a nice take on what Andy said, Andy. Reviewing, as you know, started out as news. If you go back a hundred years to the New York Times, the reason they wrote reviews wasn't that they cared what the opinion of the writer was. They wanted to know how many thousands of people came out to hear Caruso and what happened and did people like it? It was like, it was, it was a news report and it was news. But I think newspapers evolved over the 20th century to take on this other project, which was to be the conduit for a conversation about the arts. And that's what I'm really concerned about has is disappearing, regardless of the pandemic. I don't mean to sound over catastrophic, but uh, this whole era has just made me think maybe newspapers, and as Melissa suggests, can't afford it, can't afford, because they're not doing so great either, to be the umbrella or the, the lap where this 
is nurtured, where this conversation about, because it's not just, you know, I went to see this performance at SF Jazz and this happened and they haven't been here in five years and this is who the person is. It's also a conversation about, wow, what do I really think about Joshua Redden? How does he fit in? What do I think about Lafayette Gilchrist? How did it hit me? How do, what, what do we want to say about piano playing? What, you know, that's a conversation that I like to be part of, but I find less and less opportunity to be part of it. Before we get into the larger ramifications that you're suggesting, Paul, I do want to know whether you practice, as Jordana has said, going back to see what the, the uh, shows that you uh, reviewed, did you go back and review, re-watch them, re-listen to them? Before I you write, you did not. So you treated it as a regular, I'm seeing a performance, I'm gonna write the review on the basis of what I saw. Well, I, I did, although I will say, uh, the first piece that I did was about Wayne Horvitz's festival at the Royal Room, which he called the Staycation Festival, which they had planned to do anyway. Um, and there was, he and Robin Holcomb did this lovely, lovely, lovely show. It was a little eerie that first time watching a show in a place with no audience. They were freaked out because there was no audience because you're a performer, you know where the applause is supposed to come and it doesn't. Um, I went back and checked that a couple of times just because I got into a conversation with somebody about it and wanted to check. Um, and, you know, did that really happen? And that's wonderful to have. I want to ask Lafayette also, do you, how, how do you respond to reviews or to the lack of reviews? Does it make any difference if your show has been reviewed to you? I mean, I'd like it to be reviewed. <clears throat> um, um, as far as, uh, you know, what the substance of the review is, that, that's up to the it's up to the writer. I, I, of course, that's not something I would I would uh, feel one way or the other about. But um, you no, know, obviously, if we're, if we're reviewed, um, I would think uh, we would uh, you know that would increase our numbers a little bit and, and help us um, a little better economically and give us a. Um, more of a context, you know, um, and give people more of a frame of reference and context uh, for us. I mean, it's, it's, it's very important, uh, um, like Andrew um, talked about a little earlier, to, 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 give, um, to give the listener a, an idea of, um, of what they're in for, or what they're gonna uh, experience. I think that's, um, that's helpful. Um, but uh, you know, lack of um, uh, I think you know, I think it does hurt us. It hurts us. I think so. Yeah. So um, let's uh, shift back to to Melissa for a minute. Melissa, do you feel like there's a responsibility to to look at it as more of a historic moment? And I mean, I don't know how long the articles are that you assign. I assume. 500 or 750 words or something like that. And, you know, is there room for um, a historical perspective and a piece of that length or are you expecting it? Yeah, I would, if it were me doing all the assigning now, that's what I would ask for because otherwise it just becomes a string of consumer Here's when you can watch, here's how you can watch, here's what you're going to see, here's what the set list was, you know, X, Y, Z. I would like to hear, read more about what Paul was talking about, what the reviewer focused on, given the chance, of course, or what the, the reviewer wanted to focus on. Like, hey, I was always looking forward to this particular musician in this particular group or a particular thing that the soloist does but I couldn't see it because the camera did not permit me, you know, to see that thing that I, that I like. And I wish that were more of reviews because if all you give people for over a year, and this is one of my fears is all you give is live stream pre live stream previews. That's all people are going to expect. 
and they might not keep their appetite for, gosh, I really love it when, you know, so-and-so writer went to Tula's or Jazz Alley or, you know, one of those Royal Room, that place that I really like to go to and wrote a report about what happened, not just the music, but the atmosphere and the place and all the different kinds of people who go there. And, you know, I worry that people who are not regular readers of the Seattle Times or anybody's music coverage that they're just going to think the whole world is about streaming and not they don't know enough about the conversations that are being had to miss them you know i think we've missed a sort of a generation of folks who are as engaged with that as we are mm. um i'm getting questions from uh, our our uh, facebook uh viewers also and we will get to those questions I will, i'll get to them uh but then um let me ask the writers, are we looking for different uh, platforms where we can carry on those conversations, that deeper conversation that Paul was talking about? I mean, here in Chicago, we've just uh, lost our uh, daily news, um, Chicago Tribune, uh, daily uh, jazz critic, Howard Reich. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it does not seem likely that the Trib is going to hire a replacement or another another critic um but are, are we looking at weeklies are we seeing uh weeklies putting up platforms are we depending on our own blog posts and uh, platforms where can we have those conversations uh, are you and are you chasing them i mean paul says he misses them are we looking for them anybody paul andy jordana well i'm certainly I certainly contemplating start contemplated starting something and then stopped myself, <laughs> uh, hoping somebody younger would take it on. But yeah, I think we're gonna need we're going to need another kind of another platform. I don't think daily newspapers can support the conversation anymore, um, and I just I I don't know what it'll it will look like. I love your idea though, Melissa, about writing about how do I watch a stream concert and enjoy it? Because it's different. And that's something I've never done. I'm gonna pitch it to my editor at the Seattle Times <laughs> because I think a lot of people are scratching their heads in the same way I was at first. I was like, e even talking to Horvitz at, at the Royal Room, he said, yeah, he said, I don't know why anybody would watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, then I had to figure out, no, I have to make people want to watch this. And I have to think about it and come to my own conclusions about how do I enjoy this? Because it's really a different headspace. It's just like, yeah. Andy, it's different than going to a concert. It's just yeah. like, is it happening right now? Did it already happen? Am I watching a recording of it? Is it live? Am I seeing the instruments I want to look at when I want to see the fingers moving I'm looking for? Um, do I care anyway? It's on this little laptop screen. It's just, it's hard. I, I was, I haven't tuned in, into one of those Vanguard broadcasts. Every week I get the announcement. I think, yeah, I'm going to watch that. And then I have dinner, have a glass of wine and forget about it. They're pretty good. <laughs> they Pam do. Good. <laughs> yeah. Pam, Pamela, have you been reviewing? Um, to back up a little bit, my situation may be a little different. I write for a nonprofit news organization and I'm the arts columnist. So I write a column four days a week and I'm supposed to cover everything, which I always put in quotes because it's so absurd, but I, I can, what that means is I can do what I want and there's a positive and a negative on that. And I always include jazz in my previews of events that are coming. I haven't really reviewed streaming concerts. I've seen a couple of outdoor live concerts that I've written about. But one thing that I, I did really quickly back in March is I started interviewing long form interviews of arts and artists and arts leaders. And I've done almost 50 of them. And some of them are, I talked to Lowell Pickett who runs the Dakota Jazz Club, for example, in Minneapolis. And I talked to the person who runs the Twin Cities Jazz Festival. And I talked to a jazz guitarist 
and I, I, you know, I bring in as many musicians into that discussion as I possibly can. And part of the reason is we were talking a minute ago about the, this being a historical year, I'm, I'm conscious of creating a historical document of the people who are affected by this in the arts have being allowed to speak. Yeah. So, and, and recording what they have to say. And it's, and it's rough on, you know, the art, the arts are so hard hit and, it, and it's rough. And, and I generally just do phone. I don't do zoom because if you're not doing face-to-face, -face, there's less pressure, I think, and less self-awareness and less self-consciousness and people have cried. Mm. So it makes me cry. It's sad. Yeah. yeah. To piggy off of Paul and Pamela, um, I'm the baby of the group, but I'm looking for a younger person. <laughs> like, when is the 22 year old going <laughs> to pop yeah. in and, you know, write a million articles and, you know, drink too much espresso and, you know, do a good bulk of the work? But, um, I, I, I liked what Pamela said. Yeah, I think I've been doing the same thing with interviews, mm -hmm. talking directly to the artists and seeing how the situation is affecting them. And, and you know, um, and Michelle was, uh, Michelle Mercer, hi, Michelle Mercer, um, was asking a question about um, have any journalists um, had to field um, questions and all of these things during a live streaming event. And I have with the M3 um, uh, concerts. And to keep people um, excited, we had about 80 to 100 people who came in. Um, and to keep people excited, I really just had to be really positive and bubbly and ask good questions um, and, you know, answer, answer the comments and, and do all of these things at once. And it's really hard um, as a journalist to host um, a live stream presentation and panel. Um, it was also really fun and some people reached out and said, you know, it was really cool, but it was, I think the answer is to um, be yourself and have fun and have a positive uh, kind of humorous, you know, personality to kind of keep people um, excited. But, you know, everybody's different. This is, this is in the chat while the um, while the uh, music is going on. You're trying to do that in the chat to respond to other people well, who are in the chat. We had a really cool format where I interviewed. So so uh, there were twelve cohorts and six duo groups, and they pre-recorded a video and music presentation. So I actually was fielding comments and interviewing the the artist who had made those videos. So it was a pretty tough, you know, balance to um, do six interviews uh, two times. It was, there were two, excuse me, three interviews each presentation. There were two full presentations and it was, it was, um, it was very interesting, but I did like that format of interviewing the artists after they perform. So that may be, you know, Q and A normal kind of thing, but it was, it was a cool format. A lot of balls in the air. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to power through and smile and make sure that, you know, it, it didn't look as chaotic as it <laughs> actually it was in my mind. <laughs> well, Michelle goes on to say, Michelle Mercer, who I guess is watching on uh, YouTube or uh, Facebook rather, uh, that she watched a jazz award ceremony the other night, in which John Newcutt, who uh, is a WBGO uh, on air personality, assumed the work of offering background and context for the performances and that he enriched the experience for viewers that way. Hmm. And uh, gee, I, I would love to do, to do that, to get hired to be the play-by-play -play, uh, announcer on a live stream thing. That sounds hmm. like fun. Although I think it would also be very distracting for, for an artist to be performing. And it's like, instead of hearing the whispers in the background, you know somebody's like making comments all the time. Yeah, <laughs> be a little nerve wracking, wouldn't it? Then maybe you could tell us what they're playing, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually, it's really helpful. helpful. It's, it's fascinating that I've seen artists who do really regular live streams, you know, and this can be every night at eight or, you know, every Friday, but, but just that they're hitting regularly that the chat box 
is a huge part of that experience mm -hmm. where people, you know, it becomes a community and people are there, you know, weekly or really there's one I watch, you know, often it's, it's a nightly broadcast, two artists in the Bay Area, Craig Ventresco and Meredith Axelrod, guitarists, they're singers. They do this amazing repertoire of basically songs from about 1890 rags to say 1930 incredible repertoire and they perform every night at eight o'clock from their kitchen in North Beach and there are people who are there every night and in the comm box at the beginning it's hey everyone how you doing and I think people have started meeting up beforehand on zoom to have a drink together um you know an hour before and so 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 I think that's like something in the same way or, or similarly where I would go out say to Yoshi's and I'd know I was gonna see people I knew there, you know, without making plans, you just know you're gonna run into, if you're seeing a certain artist, you're gonna run into certain people. It becomes this real point of connection. And as I've been thinking in doing previews or covering these kinds of things, I've, you know, you wanna write about that because that is part of the experience. Reviewing is a whole other question. <laughs> Because I'll, I'll, you'll see the artists will interact with the comm boxes. Sometimes you stop a song, they'll look down, they see a request. It shapes the, you know, the, the set. It, it all becomes again, this sort of extra dimension that you know, I think it, it could be important to, to cover. It's part of the experience. So it's something I've thought about a lot. Another of our Facebook viewers, Trudy Leong, asks, um, has the audience for jazz increased with COVID and because of these live streams. Certainly the accessibility has increased in some sense. Uh, do you think that people are like tuning in and especially jazz because it does have the improvisational nature and, and musicians can look at the comment box and you know, in a rock show or something like that or a classical performance, I don't think you'd have that kind of interaction with the uh, audience. I would love to see those numbers from the Vanguard, frankly, because I've heard some musicians drop an occasional number and it's a pretty high number. And Kurt Elling, when he was doing his cocktails thing, and then when he did that stream of five concerts from, from the, uh, the Green Mill, I think, he was, I think he was getting pretty high numbers because he's built over all these years of touring audiences all over the world, literally. And they know he's going to be singing and they tune in from everywhere. I was uh, hosting Thursday. Kurt was on the panel that I, the Zoom yeah. panel that I was doing. He said that one of their concerts had 180,000 viewers. That's right. 180,000 viewers. Now this brings up the, uh, Anne Braithwaite posted a question, but I'll ask you, Anne, just to repeat your question here um, live. Are these reviews all happening uh, where the performance is taking place or, go ahead, Ann. I, I, no, I just, for the journalists here, I wanted to know, like Andy, for example, you're talking about writing a lot of, of previews. Are, I assume, because this is the way it used to be, but I'm curious, are they always about Bay Area artists? Because you're, or whatever paper you're writing for, are they always about local artists and local things? Or have they let, are you able to write about people all over the world because people can see them all over the world? I mean, the vast majority, there is a strong local angle. Right. So I mean, and, and Paul was asking sort of what, what are the outlets? And I, in the Bay Area, we've really been blessed with these really strong um, hyper-local websites. You know, there's Berkeley side, there's the Oakland side, there's Mission Local and, and others. And they're all interested in arts coverage. So, you know, there have been a lot of opportunities to do previews, but of course, if you're, you know, I'm writing for Berkeley side, it's something that is happening in Berkeley. Right. Um, hmm. I, I was able to cover um, Dana Stevens playing, you do a preview on his Vanguard show, which was actually ended up being postponed, you know, but, but the originally scheduled one, because he's such a, you know, he came from the Bay Area and he's this real, has a really, you know, strong local following here. So that's, you know, that's rare though. It really is, e even though we live in this world in which distance you know, has collapsed in terms of what we could experience, you know, the, the way the internet works, 
publications, if, if it's not a national publication, it's still very much, you know, why, you know, when you're talking to an editor and pitching, it's why us, why now, why this? And the strongest peg is always because, you know, they, they came out of Oakland, they live in Oakland, they live in San Francisco. Um, you know, that, that's what I'm gonna lead with when I'm pitching. Of course, that's what I thought, but I was just curious because now we do have this cornucopia. I'm a concert anywhere in the world you could attend now and it's, it's really cool, but I also wonder if people are also getting some fatigue of being, I've been on the computer. I, I know for me personally, I love, I'm so glad I get to see Lafayette play a lot because I've never seen him live before, but there are a bunch of concerts I haven't gone to because I'm just, I've been on the computer for 12 hours. And when, you know, at the end of the day, I want to be with, you know, if it's a pandemic, so you can't, but my, the way I used to feel is I'd go out and go to a club and go hear music live and see you, just like you said, you'd, you'd go and you'd know that there would be people there you knew because of the, who was performing and so forth. So I wonder, I think it's a great opportunity. And I think beyond the pandemic, we will still have live streaming, but I, I'm hoping that after the pandemic too, that a lot of people are just going to want to go out to clubs again because if there are, you know, whatever clubs are left, because we need that person to person interaction. I think people are going to stream, uh, no pun intended, yeah. out to clubs in unheard of numbers. People are so starved to be in that actual community of bodies. I, I was going to say about the uh, the Vanguard numbers, I would guess they're very high because there are tens of thousands of jazz fans all over the world who've never even set foot in the Village Vanguard. So the opportunity to suddenly tune into a concert there is probably really attractive. But getting back to something Andy said about community with the chat room, I've noticed that too on the live streams. And what the other thing that I've noticed is that the tip jar is very, very active. When the Royal Room event happened, or I just got some numbers from a little venue out in Yakima called The Seasons, where they do all kinds of music, artists are getting like two grand in tips from, a, from an evening's show. So to bring it over to the artist's point of view for a moment, um, live streaming can be not a bad deal. I think people are generous watching the show and I think people that tune in are really uh, often, they often understand that artists are going through a really tough time and they're very generous. Let's take that to the presenter's point of view and ask Henry, um, do you find that uh, number one, people are being generous? Are you attracting, and number two, are you attracting audiences from all over the world? Uh, yeah, the, the the number of ticket sales from last year uh, during the pandemic from March to, to currently, it actually is the best months for like the four years compared. So we actually have more people bought tickets on to watch the live streaming. Uh, even a lot of, when we first started, our ticket prices was only $5. So it was very affordable and we encourage donations and that is, uh, usually 20 to 30 percent of the ticket purchaser will also make a donation. Um, so I assume that as a club owner, part of your uh, income, profit income, was selling beverages. Hmm. And you don't have that now, right? Well, Andy Music is not a restaurant. So it has been started in the beginning as a listening room. So we are quite the opposite of all the jazz venues. We don't serve food. Our, our beverages is primarily is soda, water, and a beer. So it definitely doesn't have any uh, like, you know, high-end alcoholic beverages. So because it's an all-age performance space, so we have a lot of uh, high school kids, they want to give a jazz concert, they will choose Andy Music because we're the only places that actually will give them an opportunity to perform. So we haven't really lost a lot of that, uh, revenue like the other clubs are doing because our model is quite different. I see, I see. I'm curious uh, to know from Jim Wilkie if people are turning to radio because they can't go out. Are you getting bigger numbers? 
I have, I have no idea. Um, <clears throat> I do think people are listening to more radio, <clears throat> missing the uh, social interchange that we had with places like Tula's and the New Orleans and so on and so forth. We all miss that a great deal. But um, I, I haven't seen any, uh, any research on actual hard numbers on listenership, only anecdotal. Um, I've got a message from uh, Daniel Atkinson, who's a presenter in San Diego, in fact, one of the Jazz Journalists Association's Jazz Heroes. And uh, he's saying that in San Diego, the press for jazz has long been confined to previews rather than reviews. And that his streaming shows, which are at the uh, Athenaeum, have received major preview treatments, but um, really no um, uh, reviews to speak of. And he thinks that that's just the way it's been now for a while. Um, it seems, he says, um, like it could or should be that the shows are no longer, let's see, that the press could influence people to tune in after the initial stream. So it's more like a film review, mm. you know? And I wonder if we've seen mm -hmm. any, um, some performances, some streams where people go, wow, I've got to see that again. That's a classic stream. That's a classic performance. And then, you know, <clears throat> like, I'll go and watch the uh, Miles Davis at the Isle of Wight performance uh, for fun. And that was, like, what, about 40 years ago or something like that. And, uh, you know, are there streams that we just go? And, and this sort of goes back to what Melissa was saying, too, in a way, because are we reviewing the music or are we reviewing the um, video production, the stream production? Both. And then are we finding ones that we want to keep going back to because they really enrich us? I you mean, know, I, you know, Montreux uh, Jazz Festival is probably the most notable of, of you know, recorded um, live performances. And we all go back to those minus uh, my favorites, Nina Simone, I think 74. Um, and Betty Carter's version of uh, my favorite things, uh, the East Berlin performance. I'm obsessed with just that that performance. Um, so yeah, I think on a historical level, maybe over. I, I've, in regards to jazz, recently I've been focused on the next generation, and I really feel like if we prepare and, and hold these, these performances over the next five, 10, 20 years, you know, somebody who's writing their thesis, somebody who's writing their high school paper, you know, <clears throat> we'll have this, um, we'll have this information to, to be able to kind of obsess over, um, you know, these performances, but, you know, we don't know in the next 15 years, how much bigger some of, you know, these artists are gonna get like the international anthem, you know, scene, they could become, you know, in 15 years, the next Wynton Marcellus or things like that. So we don't know. So I think having these, these pieces just kind of saved and available and, and promoted by, you know, um, writers, I, I was thinking, you know, in newsrooms and even with myself, when I have an assistant once in a while, we should be getting the interns to do this stuff. And the, <laughs> you know, I, really, you know, like if, if I, I had an assistant and I did have her like, you know, write some pieces, but I, if you don't agree, that's, that's cool. But I think if we had a young, excited, you know, kid who was really, really to do, willing to do what they needed to do to get through, you say, hey, just start reviewing live reviews, that's going to be your job and get coffee and, and do these things. I think that's a good tactic um, for us who, who um, hire editorial assistants and, and who have interns and young um, journalists in newsrooms. What do you think? I don't know. I was just shaking my head because it's been so difficult to identify young people who want to write about music. I agree. I, and that's, you know, and, and jazz, and, especially. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I and, get and, that. We're looking, we're looking, and they're invited. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I would love to have an intern, but uh, I don't think, I don't think that's happening right now either. Yeah. Um, John Hanrahan, who um, is associated with Kumba uh, Jazz Workshop in, uh, in Santa Cruz, hosts, he says the pandemic has opened a door for a huge audience of streaming, especially for boomers 
and jam bands. And he says this phenomenon is here to stay. He thinks that it offers another revenue stream for artists, venues, production companies. And they're streaming from Kumba. Uh, Smalls, too, he mentions he's killing it. So there are uh, clubs um, uh, that have invested. And Henry, did you make an investment in equipment in order to um, be able to do these streams? Um, when we first started last March, uh, we I worked with uh, the Peabody Conservatory uh, Sound Engineering Department, the graduate students. So we're basically, it's kind of like a learning progress. We do one concert and we learn to improve. So primarily we focus first us on the audio part of it to make sure the sound is very good. So when people are watching the stream, they really enjoy the, the, the music, the real, the, the level of the audio level. So they would find that they would not get disappointed when they try to listen to it. And then we just keep purchasing our equipments like our cameras and we upgrade our cables and our encoders it's like month by month. So we kind of like learning to do it right. We really operate on a one to two camera uh, system. A lot like many venues, they have like six or seven cameras on a timer basis. I find it a little bit distracting when you have too many cameras and you know keep changing every 10 seconds to give me a headache. So we kind of like want people to watch our live stream like exactly they were sitting inside Andy Music, the same the venue uh, uh, frame, so they they can recognize our our venue very like intimately. So so yes, we we have investing it uh, our own money by the money that we actually make from the concerts that we make a little tiny profit and reinvest into uh, upgrading our equipment. And it's very helpful that we work with a Peabody Conservatory because we're actually giving their graduate student a chance as an internship so they can gain a lot of experience in, by doing the live streaming process with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And are you uh, uh, receiving uh, directions from some of your clients to, uh, you know, to be promoting not just their events, but actually promoting them as live stream producers? Yes, yes, we definitely are doing that. I mean, Lafayette, obviously, at Andy Music, we always promote. Um, New England Conservatory is now putting a lot of even master classes and workshops online. And, um, you know, I'm hoping we, Maria Schneider's coming to NEC and they're doing it. There's a, something called Art, which is helping students at NEC, but now it can be streamed too, um, both in pitch pitching their, they have a pitch contest where somebody wins a grant and that's going to all be live streamed and then Marie is going to conduct the orchestra. But so we are pitching it. There's not a lot of appetite because I mean, in Boston, we have a preview. Yes, absolutely. And, and there are places like Boundy, they'll put every, all the streaming stuff goes as a listing, but it's not a feature or a preview really. There are certain places that will cover and in, in the case of Lafayette and a few other people that I work with, The Wire is doing live concert reviews from the UK. I mean, they're a UK based publication as most people know, but um, they're doing live reviews. I'm not finding many people that are doing live reviews, but we're getting some previews and, you know, like the Arts Fuse in Boston, which is a local nonprofit arts, arts publication has been doing jazz previews of people all over the country, whomever they hear about and they're interested in, they'll preview that. So we are getting some things, but I don't find it's, I would love to have have everyone covering it, but I, I think we run into what Andy was talking about. I mean, local publications want to cover local things generally. Melissa, how do you think we can make some improvements in the situation for the writers, for the uh, <clears throat> readers and well, the newspapers themselves? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> there are about a hundred answers uh, to, to that. Our problem, we, we do still hire freelancers you know, to cover things, but where do you put it? Because our print readership, our digital readership is climbing, which is nice to see, but our print readership is still quite large and they pay a lot of our bills. And there's really no way to measure other than 
<clears throat> just sort of your gut instinct with phone calls and emails, how many people are reading it, something in print. Um, I think we would be doing a really great service. And I know we've done a couple of these with like classic movies, but as Jordana was talking about, looking at this as a historical record and pointing people toward great video re or recordings of historic events or great artists or, you know, this particular festival where this thing happened, you know, and tying more of that together so that people know that's out there. Because I certainly, you know, forget that. I tend to watch the same handful of music, musical performances streamed over and over because I'm just a creature of habit, but I should be looking at all the stuff, you know, that's, that's out there. And I think we would do readers a great service to do more of that, but print space has shrunk so much with the drop in print advertising revenue that even if you had a whole bunch of people covering it, where would you put it? You know, you'd have to wait till the Sunday live section, which if it's streaming, that's fine. They can go back and find it. But there's that immediacy that we used to have of getting reviews of anything or commentary of anything in the print paper is, are gone. It's just this constant fight over literally over, over space. Who well, gets so I, I remember hearing some startling and depressing numbers about how few people were reading reviews even online, which was something we could measure. Do you remember mm -hmm. those numbers? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do remember. And that was, of course, before we had the super sophisticated uh, robot system that we that we have right now. So I don't know how relevant those numbers were, but they were they were low. They were really low. And again, I thought that and maybe that was just because I wanted to justify my existence in the newsroom was that people were eating it up on in print. Our print readers are the people who paid for those kinds of concerts and wanted that kind of commentary and wanted to engage with you via email or phone or what have you. And we had no way other than demographic surveys to capture that. And that's an unfortunate thing that things like jazz and classical and opera, they suffer from that sort of lack of eyeballs. The fandom is not quantifiable in a newsroom. You have to know folks like all of you and people who are watching this and think, okay, yeah, this is a going concern. People still like it, um, but it suffers from a metrics problem. But I know people in print love it. And Paul, you know that too from all the conversations you've had with our print readership. To push back a little bit on, I mean, I agree with what Melissa is saying in terms of the service. There's a lot of value to, you know, to pointing out, to talking about the wealth of, you know, of, of concerts, of what, what can be found out there, you know, when you start diving in to YouTube. Um, I think in some ways that cuts against this idea of what we're wanting to talk, you know, saying, thinking about wanting to review live streams. And, and I think, I mean, when we think about going to see live music, right, the, the, the basic thing is everyone there has has taken the effort, has made the commitment to leave their house, right, go out, gather somewhere and somewhere at a particular time, which which is, I mean, especially from the perspective now of being locked down, is this real commitment, right? And oftentimes the first thing an artist will say, "Welcome everyone." You know, you could have been watching Saturday Night Live tonight, but here you are with us. We really appreciate you, right? The investment of experiencing something uh, on our screen, which you know our entire lives are mediated by is nothing, right? You're just scrolling and you see something and you click on it and, and you can experience it. Um, and I think this idea, it's this real challenge of, for, for artists of everything they're putting out there that, that's gonna be taken in, you know, a live stream or, or, or archived is out there competing with literally a billion other possible experiences that we could take in. So as a jazz fan, like Jordana said, we could go and relive it, our favorite Nina Simone performance or Sarah Vaughan. So what's the motivation to see something that's happening now when you're taking it in exactly the same way, you know, on a screen that it's all sort of collapsed. And I, I think in a lot of ways, it's a challenge for 
artists to think about how to, what they can do in a presentation that makes it, you know, something is happening that's going to motivate you, the viewer that this is the moment I, I, I need to be there now. And I, I think some artists are, are sort of working on that. It's, it's a real challenge. I, I, don't, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. What do you think about that, Lafayette? Uh, uh, completely, that what Joe Horowitz calls the sense of festive occasion, that is what we are all missing. And for some folks, it's like, well, if I can't see it live, I'm not going to see it. Mm -hmm. you know? And we're trying, I think, part of our mission in the as a publication is to sort of get people over that edge a little bit. Like, okay, it won't be what you're used to, but, you know, here are some other things about it. And we we have interviewed a lot of artists and promoters and venue owners about how hard this is. And I think a lot of people outside the inner fan circles don't understand how hard this pandemic has been on art venues and artists and all the people, the service people, everybody who's associated with it, they are all just suffering. And the way the aid is being trickled out and, and distributed is not equitable. Thank so you. We, Let's let's ask the artist here how he thinks about this. So Lafayette, how you know you said early on that like it was startling to you to perform without an audience there. How how have you adjusted to that? What what do you try to bring to the moment? Um, as much focus on the substance of the art itself and and the delivery. As I can as a performer, um, um, I try to make the performance and make the music as uh, with as much um, fire and intensity and sincerity as I can bring forth. Um, I haven't figured out to this point um, uh, what else to do? And, and like I uh, alluded to earlier, um, it's a leap of faith. You know? so leap that, of faith. It's a leap of faith because the thing is to do, from, from my perspective, is to you know do your work, and do your preparation, and you're a craftsman working on his craft, and you you have to make your you have to make your presentation on, on based on on on. Uh, uh, I hope that someone is listening. Someone is uh, that you you know um, you that you get into somebody. Um, but you, the point is that you're, that you're not alone. It's awful to be alone. Yeah. Have you been composing, or are you working on new projects um, during this oh, yeah. period? Oh yeah, I'm writing quite a bit. Do you take inspiration from, you know, from COVID? I mean, from the, the situation now? Have your practices changed any? Um, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I, I don't want, I don't know if I would call it inspiration that I take from it, but, um, um, but, um, but I still feel moved to write and, and, and compose and play. Um, and I, I still feel enthusiastic to share um, uh, what I've been able to, uh, to come up with. Um, I just, um, it's just a, an ever increasing angst as to one, is it the getting out there to the people? And two, what is the, uh, what is, what is going to be my future? You know, what's, what's going to happen to me? I'm, you know, I don't, I don't come from a financially, uh, well-to-do situation. I mean, I'm not destitute, but uh, it's shaky. You know? Yeah, yeah. So it's a little. Yeah. So the future, the future is something every now and then when you when you really, when you really take stock of what you put into what you're doing. You know, you know your ten toes. You, you know, you both feet in ten toes deep. So there's no there's no turning back. Uh, there's no there's no figuring something else out. Um, if there is, I really, I'm probably not that clever. <laughs> so 
I think I think way forward I've been um, trying to deal with is try to is, is really trying to go more into the art itself and, and really um, with the writing and the performing and uh, and uh, and trying to continue to just develop along um, along uh, you know my own pathway. I Please think, continue. I'm sorry. I, go ahead, Paul. Kind of lucky I, for us. Yeah, yeah, totally lucky, and I really relate to your word angst. I, I really think that that's a reflection of something that's been really upset here. If you just step back historically, you think 150 years ago, if you wanted to share your music, you played for your own community and then you had to travel for somebody to hear you. And that was the sense that you got that you had an audience and there was a back and forth between the audience. Then we started recording and then everybody had or could create an archive of previous performances and audiences related to you as a live situation if they could, if you came to their town or a recorded situation if you didn't or maybe both. Then we got the internet and videos and then we had that aspect to it. Now, everything is mediated. We don't get to see you. You don't get to go to Europe. You don't get to, somebody in Europe doesn't get to see you. The only way they can exp we can experience your music is online, in a live stream, or on a recording. And I think that's really upset everybody because having art mediated was a problem in and of itself. I mean, even in a club, as a friend of mine who's a sound person is fond of saying, even in a club, the, the music mediated because it's coming through microphones. <laughs> we, we don't even know what live music sounds like, most of us. So now we're in the situation where we really don't have people just playing for us without a microphone in a room. And I think that's causing a lot of angst. And I, I hope I hope we get it back soon. I, I had a little concert in my backyard a few uh, a few weeks ago. We had a, a little group play. Um, I'm lucky to have a backyard with a little fire pit um, and to be able to be socially distanced and, and be around some people. I, I, I think you know there's some some positive ways. I, I, I totally feel the angst and I've, I've had musician colleagues and friends cry and I, empathize and feel it every day but I, I think you know we can still look at live streaming um, with a with a an in-person model and I think that if we expand the lineups a lot of the times the live streaming are only one or two um, artists and we have to remember that the people who watch these live streams artists have followers journalists have readers and so, you know, the, the, the wider the lineup, I think, and maybe, you know, online festivals could pull in a thousand people because we have, you know, 50 viewers for this band and 50 viewers for that band. And, you know, I, I think we could, you know, think and, and strategize. Hopefully we won't have to for another year, you know, or two. Um, but I, I think there are models that that we could really think about. And yeah, if we expand the lineup to instead of one or two um, artists to maybe three to five artists that that will bring in, you know, a communal, um, you know, uh, following. And I, I just wanted to say, I see my colleague from Amsterdam News, Ron Scott, and I just wanted to say we've never met. I just wanted to say hi. But, you know, I, I try to be the, the the cheerleader and try to, you know, <laughs> keep everybody excited, but it, it, it is a painful time for sure. Maybe I should ask Ron uh, whether he's been doing any reviewing for the Amsterdam News during this past year. I don't see the, the Amsterdam News in Chicago. Hi, Ron. Unmute yourself, Nancy. Unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Hi. How's, how's everyone doing? We're good. Great. I see Anne. She, I've never met her. She, she sends me press releases all the time. <laughs> yeah, Anne. Hey, Anne. Hi, Ron. Nice, nice, to, meet nice you. to meet you. I know. I've never met. I'm happy to see you here. Right. 
I've I've been kind of doing like a, a dual role. I've been I've been oddly enough I've been re actually reviewing some some live streams exactly. and what or I've been doing previews, but it, but at the same time, as a black writer with everything that's going on in America now, sometimes I feel like. I'm not doing all that I can do by just writing jazz. So consequently, I've I've been going back and forth. I've been I've been writing about um, the situation with George Floyd, police brutality, looting, and at some points tying it into the music, and, and at some points just dealing with the the history of black folks in America and how the police shootings all relate back to when we were first brought here. So and as far as the um interviews, a lot of musicians that I talk to, they all tell me that they are practicing more. You mm -hmm. know, some musicians are saying, well, I don't want to get involved with that with that streaming stuff. I'm just gonna write music and I'm just gonna practice. And when we come out of it, I'll be ready. You know, so, um, and ironically, I take this as kind of a personal joke, but it's, it's Black History Month. So I've been writing tons of stuff. I mean, this, right, like right now I'm writing my column, but up until last night for the past, Almost two weeks every night I've been up until like 12, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning writing for different publications on black history and music and different other as political and other stuff. So that sounds good. Hmm. That sounds good. Andy, have you dealt with um, uh, any writer's block or, uh, you know, hesitation to work? Has, it, has the COVID thing dampened your spirits any? Yeah, I mean it's um, I mean it's brutal. I and, and I've got you know a, sort of as good a situation as you could have in terms of you know being employed. And my daughter's come through this really well. She she's eleven, and so there. But I found that I say I lost I don't know forty fifty percent of my work say on average through this of the normal you know workload I would have, and that everything takes it still takes almost the same amount of time. Like everything takes a lot longer. Writing is just, and I got to say, part of that is, you know, uh, as Ron was alluding to, there are, I mean, with everything going on in our country, certainly building up to the election, it's just so hard to concentrate. Um, so I, not, not that it's, things have been, it's always slow, right? In January is a slow time for, for work and for, for whatever's going on. So now it's getting busy again. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just so hard. You can't compare it to anything. The, I, I've been very grateful for the amount of work that I've been able to, you know, to, to rope in and, and do. And for artists who are, you know, as always, like giving, creating all this beauty to, to, to write about. Um, I, yeah, don't know what we do without that. Well, you it doesn't have... show, Andy. It doesn't show that you're struggling with it. You know, the page has always mediated for writers, Pamela. We don't have, except for talking like this, we're always filtering our views through that keyboard and mm -hmm. that page, you know? So uh, we have a little bit of guard, a little bit of protection and a little bit of... Uh, revision possibilities that, you know, help us that the musicians who are playing live don't, don't really. Right. Hmm. Listen, we only have about five minutes left. So if there are any more uh, uh, questions from anybody, the YouTube people, or if anyone wants to make some final statements, we should uh, think about doing that now. Um, Miriam, have you gotten anything out of the conversation? Yes, I actually, would like to, well, it's, it's uh, I wonder, uh, and I wanted to ask um, to all of you, but especially Lafayette, because he's a musician. Uh, 
if you really think that um, live streaming is really is the is the is going to be the main uh, venue for 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 artists um, because I feel um, I can relate with Andrew's point of view when he was saying uh, the moment is now and that's the truth the moment is now and um, whatever the the main venue for musicians to show their works is going to be i will adapt but i'm not really sure <laughs> about what that venue is uh, uh, do you understand i i mean in spain i think it's going to be different uh, during the summer because Mm, it's uh, easier to have uh, social distancing um, in the open, uh, but we'll see. I I don't know what what is going to happen to jazz festivals this year, but it looking a little better than the year before. So I wanted to to really know if you are um, thinking that um, live streaming is going to be the thing for uh, live music. Lafayette, that's at you. Or Henry, you could pick that up also. In fact, Henry, since uh, you know, you're know you doing the streaming and you also have a live, uh, a venue for live music, we're, we're, what do you think is gonna be in the future? I, I... Just my humble opinion, I personally think that you people always want to be going to a venue to be attending a live performances. A live streaming will be beneficial, uh, I think, for a lot of musicians, especially if you are upstart musicians to want to reach out to a border audiences throughout the world and even in your community. Because again, live streaming, you can watch it at any given time. Like for our live streaming, it's good for seven days. So it's really no excuse that you have time conflict, you can watch it, you know. And, and we will definitely will be adding live streaming uh, when we can have uh, live audiences because there are definitely a lot of people are more reluctant to go out to socializing in a, in a public arena uh, with with a lot of people surrounding them. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has given a, a, a reality check for all of us for our, for our health concerns. And I, unfortunately, I think we're gonna lose a percentage of our regular audiences in the past, even when things are back into normal. Mm. So a hybrid is actually, it would be an add-on. I, I agree, yeah. That's mm -hmm. interesting. That's I think that's definitely going to happen from what I've heard from presenters. It's an extra revenue stream because a lot of presenters have invested in a lot of equipment to do really good live streams. So why not? If I were a presenter, I'd figure, hey, if you didn't see the show live, we have a recording of it. Here's how much it costs. This is how much goes to the artist in addition for every stream. Um, I would say that, yeah, we're moving into a hybrid era. You know, I was just thinking, I'm sorry, who else? Just... Oh, I just was going to say, the, the club owners that I've spoken to here in New York, they all said that they're going to keep the live streaming going once we come back and folks can come back in the club because like someone just said, it's like, it's going to be like, it'll be like gravy. You know, you have the, you have the live audience and now you have the live stream to, to go with it. So, yeah. 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 I just think about if we had had, live streaming in the 50s and I could have seen Monk and Coltrane and, mm. you know, Mingus and I mean, all that stuff. We were so grateful when those DVDs started to come out and the VHS tapes and we were able to see historic performances. Now the history is being made in the present and there's so much of it, like figuring out how, what to go for. It's really quite an amazing time. Okay, so we're gonna wrap this up. Michelle Mercer says, thanks to all the panelists. 
And she says, I want to see every one of you at live concerts in far flung places in the after times. In the meantime, <laughs> see you in the live stream chat rooms. Back and I think that, hey. that speaks for all of us. Yeah. That's let's, cool. let's see each other in chat rooms. Let's see each other online. And let's see each other uh, live again soon after times of this COVID. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, Howard. So Great that was nice seeing everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure to meet everybody. everybody. Okay. Lafayette. Right. Thank you. Lafayette, Thank you. Gil, Chris, Henry Wall, Jordana. Jordana, Elizabeth, Ann right. Braithwaite. Mm -hmm. Email me. Andy Gilbert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Paul DeBarras. <laughs> Melissa Davis. Marianne Ar Arbalejo. Ron Scott. Thank you, everybody, for being here. All right. Thank you, Howard. So, um, hey, Jordana. I yeah. said Jordana, didn't I? Yeah. Marsha right. Hacker from New Jersey is thanking I wanna, us. I want to get in touch with you, sis. Yeah, I wish I could put my email on the, the chat, but I, I don't. Uh... I'll, I'll connect you guys. Thank you, Ann. I was going to ask yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, connect you with you. <laughs> Jim Wilkie, thanks everybody for being here. And uh, this will be on YouTube so that uh, it can be uh, reviewed in archive form also. The nice to see some familiar faces, by the way. Right. Indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you. to the Jazz Journalist Association, to uh, Adriana Prieto, and to Susan Brink, who are doing the uh, back office work on uh, this Zoom event. And we'll do something else again soon. Oh, cool. So thanks, everybody. All right. Stay Thank well. You. Stay warm. All right. Wear your mask. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Wash your hands. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye